Hello, welcome to Come and Make It. I'm Stephen Calhoun. Um, this is Rich Tompkins, VP of the Southwest here at Variable. How you doing today, Rich? Doing well. Glad to be here. As am I. So uh, today we're going to talk about the down cycle agility discussion that's been going on um, inside our company here for a minute. Um, it's, it's an interesting topic, um, and it's it's also often talked about as you know recession or recession proofing uh, manufacturing recession strategies is what we're we're calling this episode today. Um, so could you give a little background on how uh, this topic originally came up? It's something that you uh, wrote a blog on, actually. It's been, oh gosh, almost a year now um, since that blog was published. So can you, can you talk about where that came from? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so the idea of like down cycle agility and really flexibility period is core to our thesis, core to the reason why the company was created was helping businesses better manage demand variability. And that isn't just the upswing, it's also the downswing and being prepared as a business to address whatever that volatility looks like. And obviously uh, with COVID, we saw an extreme example of how being agile in a down cycle was critically important. And so for those businesses who did have a better ability to be more flexible and agile when that downturn happened, um, they reap the benefits of not having a lot of fixed costs on their books, being able to scale down quickly, and then being able to scale back up quickly as volume returned. But that was really the, the impetus for it was that major event was just the perfect demonstration of something that a business needs to be ready for, or certainly an opportunity where a business could really take advantage of that situation and really thrive in an, in an environment where a lot of other businesses were uh, really crippled during that that period of time. Right. And these these are things that are they're hard to prepare for. Um, but if you happen to have been doing the right mixture of things, um, like you say, you really were set up to do something that not many people could do during that time. Um, so we've pulled up here. Um, if you're watching on video, there's a graph on screen um, on what a recession looks like for a manufacturing business. Um, so when those down cycles come, when a recession comes and things are tight or the supply chain is wacky, um, you get something that looks like this. And there's uh, about you know five dots here that are specific sections we're going to highlight here. Um, so we'll start with the first one. And this is you know kind of day to day. This is your baseline, what you're looking at any given month, um, any given week, really. Things are going up and down. You've got that dark blue line for demand. So your demand's always changing day to day. And then your capacity tends to stay, you know, outside of using something like on-demand labor. It's pretty steady. There's attrition naturally happening. Um, Rich, you see a lot of this. You talk to a lot of businesses about this. So kind of, I mean, what's your take there on this first point? Yeah, certainly. So <clears throat> obviously this graph shows a really extreme example of demand dropping off a cliff and then back up and that's what you're drawn to but there's so much value to be had even in this point one alone right so a business's demand it varies day to day week to week certainly you know you might have heavier earlier in the week volume because you've got a lot more inbound you might have later in the week volume for whatever case and right now businesses are just dealing with it because that's what they've been do doing forever it's staff to averages and just bake in the kind of like cost of doing business, if you will, of being over or understaffed and compensating for that lack of flexibility, really in the form of extended lead times or margin erosion if you're overstaffed. So there's a ton of value here. And this is what we're kind of at its core trying to help businesses address is that day-to-day -day demand variability and being able to match capacity in real time with what that looks like. Um, right. So, yeah, I mean, that that's every single business. You know, you, we don't run across many businesses who are producing exactly a thousand widgets every day without fail, with kind of no sort of business disruption or without any sort of supply chain interdependencies where their upstream or, or downstream businesses in their supply chain aren't impacted that's, that's impacting the business themselves. So. Uh, a ton of ton of value here 
um, just in addressing the, this first point. Yeah, for sure. Um, and the counterpoint to that playing devil's advocate, you know, a lot of businesses, it's, they're looking at it as, you know what, this is good enough. It's good enough most of the time if you're not concerned with optimizing, which supply chain professionals should be. But as this, this shows, we get further into this graph, the gap between your demand and your capacity gets pretty big and stays there a while. And that's when you run into some real problems. Um, so as we work towards that, you could see in point two, the macroeconomic factors hit. There's reduced demand for whatever reason. Um, and you could see here, it's, it's, as you said, a dramatic example, it falls off a cliff. And then your capacity, there's a lag there. Um, so um, what you'll see there is some attrition might happen, some of your natural attrition. And then we get to point three, um, which if you watch the news, you see layoffs uh, when they happen, uh, sometimes big, sometimes not as big. But um, that's when the lag, you know, you're trying to keep up. You're trying to uh, cut down on your workforce because you have to um, to keep up with the lower demand um, so that you're not just hemorrhaging money. Um, you know, I've, I've covered a couple points here, Rich, but I, I want to give you, uh, you know, some space to speak on that. So, so what are your takes on, on this section of the graph here? Yeah, definitely. You know, it's all about, it's all about uncertainty, right? And you, know, you kind of sympathize with the business a bit on wishful thinking that that demand will return or it's really temporary. Uh, and that might not be the case. And particularly for a small business, having that much excess capacity can be really troubling. You know, a lot of the, the small businesses uh, out there, like they can't afford to do that. And so that, that's one piece is hanging on for too long and being hopeful about the future when there is a lot of uncertainty. Um, that puts a business in a bind and it really jeopardizes the entire company itself. Uh, but then the other point to here, too, is because businesses are, are hopeful or wishful that volume is going to return, they don't cut enough quickly enough, despite that being the right case. Um, you know, they're they're again, they're holding on to people when instead they really should take a deep cut as quickly as possible because uh, that's what's in the best interest of the business. And then going forward, be more flexible with a model like ours. And, and just because you're having to lay people off, it doesn't mean they're gone forever and you never see them again. Like we've had a lot of really neat examples where the business's demand has fallen off quite a bit. They have to make cuts in the best interest of the business going forward. And what they're doing is they're offering those former employees the option to come and work at their business, but as a variable operator saying, hey, I, I can't give you 40 plus hours a week of work, but I think I can do 15, 25, whatever the case may be. So I can retain you at my business, but it's just going to be on an as needed basis. And in doing so, they provide a soft landing for the worker and that they still have the option to work there. They have the option to work elsewhere through our, our platform, but they also don't lose a lot of that institutional knowledge that that person might have from having worked there several years potentially. So your options don't have to be lose somebody forever or hold on to them. Like there's a good middle ground opportunity and that's where we can be really valuable in these times when a business does need to make a dramatic cut for the best interest of the business. Yeah. Uh, you bring up a good point there. The, um, the options that open up for, for the business and for the worker, um, because when, when you're having to let people go and then their options are not just you now, it's you and, you know, 20 other businesses in the area who also are in the, a tough situation and they can give, you know, 10 hours here, 10 hours there. Um, that's, that's a good thing to highlight there. Um, and so I think what you were talking about is also shown in the graph here, like after point three, the teal line there, um, there's another slow decline. And then you see another drop where that's kind of a reaction to, Hey, we're not, we're not keeping up. Um, and so it's kind of a gradual, slow thing instead of an all at once, which would have been uh, more efficient. But then um, moving on to point four here, uh, demand does increase as a recession fades. Things pick back up eventually. Um, and then a lot of businesses end up using overtime or they try to hire more people to keep up. Um, but I mean, as, as everyone knows, 
hiring people can take a little while um, and you got work to do today and overtime is expensive. Um, so, and then uh, Rich, if you want to go from there, just carry us into point five. Um, and just yeah. Take the yeah. Rest of the graph. And then a little bit on point four there. So, you know, point four, you're the business owner. You're partially <laughs> excited that demand is picking up, but also really concerned about the ability to deliver. And if you can't deliver, then you're going to lose that customer. So it's really a predicament for the, for the business owner there. Um, because as demand is picking up at one, at one point, you're not sure if that's going to sustain. So you don't want to get into that situation where you're hiring again, but you know, to your point, hiring is slow and then you're compensating for it with overtime. And then guess what? You have too much mandatory overtime that your workforce doesn't work. And then they turn over, uh, because they're working 40 plus, you know, 50, 60 hours a week. And that just isn't sustainable. So then, you're right back where you started with have, trying to play catch up there, um, knowing that over time to a certain degree might be good for a worker, but not in excess, knowing that two, hiring is difficult, three, uncertain where that demand trend line is going to head into the future. It's a really big guessing game and it puts a diff business in a difficult position determining, is this trend going, going to continue or not? And how do I best forecast? And again, our, our whole point of view is let's take the guesswork out of matching capacity with demand and just respond in real time better. So that it, again, sympathize with, with uh, business owners here when they're trying to figure out what does the demand look like in the future? And then again, making sure that they aren't getting in the situation where they hire more people and then have to lay them off because, you know, it doesn't continue to go up and to the right. Yep. <clears throat> and speaking of up and to the right, we'll move into the, the point five here. Um, so again, demand continues to increase, but you aren't going to be able to hire in perfect lockstep with your demand. It's not like you bring on your four people and good thing. That's when, <laughs> when your demand picks up to need exactly those four more people, it's, it's going to be, um, you know, a squiggly line to, to the graphic here in the future. And so being able to match that with hiring is impossible. Uh, so again, our, our model gives you the ability to stair step or, you know, to kind of incrementally add capacity on a per day basis, on a per week basis, as that volume increases. And really, you're just going to be playing catch up that entire period, because again, to Stephen's point, you aren't going to be able to hire quickly enough for that demand. And you don't want to jeopardize that business by not having the, the capacity to, to meet your SLAs or your desired service levels to execute that order for the customer. Um, so really, really important that a business remains flexible and agile here on the upswing too, just knowing that, you know, you, you aren't sure what that's going to look like and, and how steep the recovery might be. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just to kind of recap in the graph here, um, you want to prepare ahead of time for all these things that are going to happen um, because we've talked a lot about flexible labor Um and being able to adapt in real time, um, you can find on-demand labor on demand. Um, that's, you know, it's in the name, but building that capacity, building a, what we call a labor pool will take a little bit of time. Um, and it, it takes a little more time depending on how big your labor pool is. Um, so part of preparing for a recession and building down cycle agility is preparing that labor pool and, um, building a process around how you're going to use flexible labor in your business. Um, so now we'll move from talking about what a recession looks like into what you could do to prepare for it. Um, so down cycle agility, um, the definitions up on screen, uh, but, you know, just in your own words, Rich, um, what's, what does this, this mean for you? Yeah. <clears throat> so down cycle agility is, really the, the business's ability to respond quickly to that drop. And the businesses who are using an appropriate amount of flexible labor or kind of flexible capacity in their operation are going to be the ones that benefit. Um, and so, you know, we, we talk a lot to businesses about really find that minimum demand line that you can foresee. And that might be something that you need to kind of hire or use staffing for us to meet that baseline demand. But 
for everything else, it should be variable because that's the nature of the demand itself. And so that ability to scale down quickly uh, is really important to where you can get to your, your low point. And we saw a lot of that happen, you know, not only with COVID, not only with winter storm in Texas in 2021, and we'll get to that. Um, but, you know, you even see it with some of the businesses that we work with on a, on a regular basis who they know their kind of bottom demand uh, is X units a day. And so they might only have zero or one or two variable operators in there, uh, but then they'll scale up to 150 operators in a matter of a day or a couple of weeks if their demand picks up quite a bit. So that's a really good example of a business riddle, really uh, maximizing their ability to scale down quickly, just depending on order volume by, by really carrying that minimum necessary amount of FTEs that they can possibly foresee. Right. I, mean, I can't imagine the army of uh, recruiters that that would take to get 150 people in a week. Yeah, impossible. Yeah. Um, so how, how can you use on-demand labor to gain down cycle agility? We've got some points up on screen. Um, you know, as, as Rich was talking about, there's some unforeseen external events. Um, there are also internal disruptions. Um, I can think of a few examples of things like that, just perhaps equipment or, yeah. you know, you, you change a line, you change a process. Um, but what are some of the things that you've seen? Yeah. Uh, some really, some really neat examples here. Um, so the unforeseen external events, you know, we, we've talked about that, uh, the, the internal disruption to your point. Yeah. It might be, we've got a handful of machines that are down. It might be, you know, the Suez Canal was blocked. Uh, we aren't able to get our materials in time. Therefore, we can't produce what we need to produce. Therefore, you know, we don't have any work. And, and that stuff happens. Um, and level load across facilities, we saw this with a medical supplies distributor where they were shifting volume from one facility in Houston to another facility in Dallas. And so they needed to just in time, scale down their capacity in Houston and at the same time, scale it up uh, equally in Dallas. And so being able to scale up and down in a distribution network type environment with a business was critical so that they could seamlessly transition the servicing of an account from one facility to another to allow uh, for that existing facility, Houston, uh, to be able to take on more and different customers. So uh, some, some really neat examples there where some businesses uh, with, you know, higher maturity usage really foresaw that and used our model as a, a competitive advantage to make those types of internal decisions on how they swap volume between sites. Yeah, I think that last one is big as companies are looking to localize uh, their, their distribution efforts that um, I think we'll see a lot more of that one. Yeah. Um, so uh, moving on, the, uh, the next thing here, using on-demand labor to survive a recession. Um, so these are some of the same points that we saw earlier, you know, that, that, um, but sort of re, refactored and looked at through the lens of if you have on-demand labor. Um, so when that demand increases, you've got to plan on a shorter horizon or you get to do that now instead of trying to play guesswork games and, and try to forecast way out into the future. Cause I mean, the further out your forecasts go, the less accurate they are. Um, and so then you're using this flexible capacity to meet demand in real time. Um, and I know that we have plenty of examples of this. Um, and Rich, you've worked with a lot of businesses on this too. Um, and so kind of what's the general, um, feel in a company that doesn't have on demand labor during these hard times versus one that, that does. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, trepidation with with what lies ahead. Uh, and I think the businesses that we work with <clears throat> kind of first who have a more mature kind of usage and understanding of how they can use on demand labor in their operations, I, I think they feel pretty confident, uh, maybe in not where the market's heading potentially, but in their ability to, to weather that and come out stronger. Conversely, businesses who aren't prepared for that you know, they're, they're coming to us with questions on what should we do? And we're worried about losing people and, and so on and so forth. Um, so really, I, I think about it through the lens of the more uncertainty ahead, 
the more you should rely on a on flexible labor or the greater your percentage of flexible labor should be in your facility. So if if you're concerned uh, about what we're, what lies ahead, you know, based on the market itself, based on your industry, based on your up or downstream uh, customers or vendors, uh, you, know, you need to think critically about that and make sure that you have a proportional amount of flexible capacity at the ready to be able to weather whatever the, the next day, week, several months look like for you. Yeah. And I think tying that point to a point you, you previously made there, um, that that flexibility you build, it's kind of like a grassroots thing. It starts in this facility. And then if you have, you know, multiple facilities, you also use it in another facility, then you unlock the ability to, you're not just flexible within those facilities, you're flexible across them. So it, it kind of builds on top of each other until your, you know, your, your whole day to day just looks different. You have more flexibility, you can make quicker pivots into different ways of doing things. Yeah, exactly right. Um, so I, that's, that's a really exciting idea. And I feel like, um, when, when we are talking to businesses or when we do case studies on businesses, we really feel the excitement come through on, this is a big difference for us. This is not having to worry as much. This is knowing and having the confidence that you mentioned that if things go up or things go down, we'll be okay either way. Yeah. Um, so here's a great example that I know that you're, you're very familiar with, um, and both of us being based in Texas experienced firsthand being, you know, frozen indoors for a week. Um, so can you kind of speak through what this experience was like uh, being on the ground for all this? Yeah, this was a this was a neat example. And there's there's a couple of things going on here. So to, to set the stage here, but this was you know, kind of the, the back half of 2020 and you know, Q1, Q2 of 2021. Um, so we started working with a business. We you know, kind of started ramping up with them, uh, supporting them through some holiday volume. And then uh, into the year, beginning of the year, they decided to uh, acquire one of their competitors. So you'll see there that the numbers are a little difficult, difficult, but they roughly increased their capacity by 2x in a matter of a week to be able to handle all of that new uh, volume that was coming online after their acquisition. And so you saw they quickly were able to double their capacity, almost triple their capacity in a couple of weeks to make sure that they were hitting their service levels. There weren't any sort of business dis disruptions and they were able to, to execute that uh, seamlessly and quickly, which was just a, a huge win for the business itself. And then uh, again, if you were around here in February, of uh, 2021 in Texas, we had a, a big winter storm hit where um, you know, most all cities were, were pretty shut down for a couple of days at least. And so you saw that same business drop from you know, about 100 operators a day down to 30. Um, so having that ability to scale down quickly, that created a ton of down cycle value for them where they weren't paying for those 60 people roughly a day for the week um, when they didn't have the volume for it, when they didn't have the, the need for it. So they were able to scale down quickly and then pop right back up from about 30 operators to 120 operators that very next week. And so, so they could chip through their backlog, get back on track um, once that kind of storm recovery period happened. And then at the very end there, uh, with some of the Texas reopening news, after some of the COVID restrictions, they were able to, to bump up capacity another 25, 30% in a matter of weeks. So it, this really paints the picture of them kind of working through their day-to-day, week-to-week types of volume differences. Uh, and then having done that and then building a labor pool big enough, they were able to scale up quickly uh, meet that demand for the new customer, scale down with a, with a with a weather event, pop back up, and then environmental circumstances with the reopening stuff. All of a sudden, all these you know bars, restaurants, ho hotels were back up and running again, and they had to support those businesses just in time. And their ability to do so uh, enabled them to to keep a pretty strong reputation in the space for being able to to achieve the the service levels that those companies needed. So really, really neat example by the business, and really demonstrates the um just the 
the aggressiveness with which a business can can use our model to to meet their demand. Yeah, that's a it's a really drastic change to go from, you know, week seven of the year, ninety five um, on demand workers down to thirty one the next week, and then immediately back up to a hundred and thirteen. I mean, yeah. that's that's crazy. In, impossible to do any other way, but without you know, significant margin erosion or um, impact to their uh, customer commitments on on-time delivery. Yep. Um, so that flexibility of going up and down, um, we talked about extensively here. Uh, there are other benefits of creating a labor pool, um, such as there's the access to skilled and vetted labor, um, you know, specifically on our platform. There are ratings, um, there are skills that they can claim and show off, and that's then verified by other businesses because every business will rate um, an operator after their interaction with them. Um, you know, no commitments required for, to a, a third party, um, no admin costs, zero cost to scale. Um, all those things are great benefits of creating a labor pool uh, that you really start to recognize when you commit to building that flexible capacity um, and and adding those people to um, I know that you like to talk about it as like a bench, like the, the sports analogy is, is really good for that. Um, you know, you're, you're adding your, your favorite players to your bench and then, you know, when somebody needs to tag in, they tag in. Yeah, no, there's a, obviously a ton of benefits for everything that we've talked about in terms of the agility piece, but it's also completely critical because the, gig economy or the kind of ind independent contractor economy right now represents about 50% of the workforce. So if you're a business who's not tapping into 50% of the workforce, then you're missing just a ton of excess capacity at your fingertips. And that's perfectly complementary with what your business needs, which is flexibility to meet that uh, varying demand. So uh, it's a totally necessary solution for every business we believe uh, in the manufacturing and logistics type space and it really complementary with what the workforce is increasingly seeking, which is more flexibility to be their own boss, diversity of skills and experience. So truly a win-win for both sides of the, uh, the marketplace. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I think we're ready to wrap up here. Um, so thanks so much for your time um coming in here with us today um we're gonna hit some questions and answers before we go real quick um so i think we've we've had a few questions roll in here um when should i start building a flexible workforce um do you want to take that one yeah right now uh, <laughs> is the easy answer uh you know i mean we we run into this all the time where a business says oh like not ready yet or we've got this holiday coming up or you know let's start after this point in time but uh, there's really no better time to start than right now and getting started is quick and easy and you know in a day in, in a, a few hours like you, you can tap into that kind of flexible capacity that's gonna help you kind of shore up your flank or um, you know kind of prepare you for whatever uncertainty lies ahead um, and even really just kind of prepare you to, to tackle some of the uh, variable demand work that's coming through, tackle some of the indirect work that's been on your to-do list forever that's, you know, maybe dragging full-timers off the, off the line to do it. So um, start now. No reason not to. It's quick, easy, and you're going to be, um, you know, benefit immediately from starting to build up that flexible capacity for your facility. Yeah, so... Hope that answered your question. Yeah, you should, you should start now. Sum it up. <laughs> no reason to wait. Uh, how long does it take to build? Um, I, that really depends on um, how big your labor pool needs to be. But I mean, what would you say as kind of a rule of thumb for that, Rich? Yeah, it, it, it depends. Uh, to your point, you know, if, if your need for flexible capacity is, you know, five, 10 operators, then, you know, kind of getting to a, a pool of 20, 30 operators or so, you know, it, you can do that in a, in a week uh, for a facility with larger swings who needs a greater percentage or a greater number of uh, 
flex capacity, then it might take a bit longer. Uh, but really, we talked to the business about like, what is the right, um, what is the right time frame with which we need to bring in operators? Essentially, what is your kind of intake capacity? Because we don't want to jam a bunch of operators into a business on day one to try to to get your labor pool of 50 in one day, if that's going to cause business disruption. So it's really like how many operators can we bring into your, or can be brought into your facility uh, such that it doesn't cause business disruption uh, and really try to work with the business to understand what some of those kind of intake requirements are. But, um, you know, I'd say anywhere from, you know, four to 12 weeks is probably the norm for businesses, just depending on, uh, you know, their size, their need and, and their capacity to, to bring on new people. All right. Well, uh, it looks like we have uh, hit time here and covered a few questions off. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for tuning in. Um, thank you, Rich, for being here uh, with us today. This has been another episode of Come and Make It. Um, if you are interested in what we've been talking about, and I do hope that you are, um, it's important, as we mentioned, to start building now. Um, Downcycle agility is not going to happen overnight. Um, you need to be prepared and, and build that up. Um, but you can start today building a labor pool. Um, so to do that, just go to the URL. It's on screen right now. Um, or if you're listening on audio only, um, that's www.variableops.com. Um, Variable Ops is V E R Y. A B L E O P S. Um, so go check out the website. Um, sign up's pretty pretty low lift there to sign up. Um, and then our our team will be in contact and as Rich mentioned, um, advise you on on building a labor pool and um, they'll be there to help you along the way. So appreciate you tuning in. Uh, have a great week and we'll catch you next time. All right, appreciate it. <laughs>